Hey, everybody. Welcome to Osiamo's first artist podcast. We've got a great guest for our initial uh, episode here, Booker King, who's toured the world, laying down thunderous grooves across multiple genres of music. His resume features recordings and performances with Santana, Paul Simon, Billy Coblin, Jane Saberi, Defunct Big Band, Yoko Kana, Dean Brown, Bill Sims and the American Roots Orchestra, and Leela Downs, and lots more. And welcome to the show, Booker. How you doing, man? Hey, how are you, Ed? I'm doing all right. Yes, I'm doing okay. So uh, you got some exciting news to uh, share with our viewers here? Well, I'm in a, a new project um, led by Corey Glover uh, from Live in Color and Mike Orlando from Adrenaline Mob. And it's called Sonic Universe. The first two singles are out now. The album called is titled It Is What It Is um, is going to be released May 10th, which is also my birthday um happy early birthday <laughs> you know we'll see you know how it goes but it's been received really positively so far you know the only thing that i have you know that i'm kind of annoyed with is that in new york there is no contemporary rock station in new york it's all classic rock so to hear the record, I have to go to New Jersey or upstate or Connecticut. <laughs> and who wants to do that, really? <laughs> <laughs> but they're, they're rocking the song in other places, man. It's like, you know, they send videos of people playing it on the radio. Um, one of the main DJs from one of the stations in New Jersey has really she posted an article she wrote and you know it's it's been getting some really positive stuff which is nice that's yeah. great that's great yeah. and so how did this project come together well this project originally started before the pandemic i started getting um a mutual friend of Corey, mike and me called me up and he said, you know, normally we, you know, do text conversations. And he says, Booker, can I call you? And I said, sure. So he calls me, he says, Booker, there's this project and uh, Corey's going to be in it. And uh, this guitar player named Mike Orlando, who I didn't know at all at that point. And he said, um, Rick, does a record company not only interest, they've already basically signed the act. And I was like, well, you know, I'm always interested in something that's always upwardly mobile and already has, you know, a contract. Right. So I said, okay. I said, well, you know, before I can absolutely say yes, I said, send me what you got. And he sent me, I think, seven songs. Right. And I listened and I I, th I think I listened to the first eight measures of I am. And I called him back and I said, yeah, we can we can call this one. Yeah, I'll be doing this. Wow. And then the pandemic happened and everything stopped. Right. And it took like another year before anything got done. And then everything just, it was just quiet. And I go, well, maybe, you know, they just decided against it after all this time. Because all you got to do is give a record company time to think. You know, you give somebody time to have second thoughts about something, sometimes they change their mind. Right. And fortunately, they hadn't changed their mind. It just got delayed, you know. And then out of nowhere, you know, after all this time, uh, I get this text from Corey that says, you know, uh, Booker, um, are you free November 1st and 2nd? It was a Wednesday and a Thursday. 
And I said, I think I can do that. I said, what's up? He says, well, we're doing a two-day video photo shoot for the band. I said, why didn't you start with that? <laughs> because I would have said, I would have just said, when is it? And that would have been it. It could have been Friday, Saturday. It could have been whenever. I would have okay. said yes. But he didn't start with that. He said, are you free first? So we did the, um, we did the, we did three songs. Uh, the two singles that are out now, I Am and Higher, and uh, a third single, which is the title track of the album, It Is What It Is. And that is, we nobody, only the band has seen that, and I guess some other people, some other, you know, lucky folks. And that is my personal favorite video, because it is raw and rocking. Cool. You know, really can't wait for people to see that one, because it's just... It's just nasty. It really is. And right. Glover, you know, I've known Glover for a really long time. So for him to surprise me is a very rare thing. And he he reaches down and he gets to places that I was like going, wow, you still got that in the toolbox, don't you? I mean, he sounds fresh as a daisy on everything. He really does. Yeah, I really like the, I've only heard the one track, I Am. And I was thinking the same thing when I was listening to his voice. It's like, man, this is like vintage, like Corey Glover. I mean, like. Yeah, yeah. And you know. He sounds great. I mean, the band sounds great. Really, really. Yeah. So yeah, what's it, it like? It, you've worked with Corey before and now you've worked it, working with him again. What's it like working with him? What's changed in the music industry? What's changed? I think I think the only thing that's changed in the music industry is that we got older. We go. That's pretty much it. Um, and the business is really decentralized. You know, it used to be those few record companies, and if you didn't get through to them, right? You just you just didn't get through. Um, the band assigned to a German label called Air Music, and Air Music. It's kind of like if you look at their catalog, they're kind of genreless. It's like they do a lot of rock, but they do mm -hmm. dance music. They do a whole bunch of stuff. And, you know, like I think Alice Cooper's on the label and a bunch of things like that. So it's like there's some classic rockers on it, there's some mm -hmm. new rock on it, there's some, you know, rock from places that, you know, from other countries, which is great to hear as well and they're really into pushing this so you got some tours yeah. coming up you have tours scheduled or well we have to you know living color is is still out touring so we have to actually sit and wait until they have a break to get out there and that's if you know glove is not too you know tired because let's face it the voice is the only instrument that's in your body right. you know and you do everybody has limitations now i've been on the road with Corey before and i've seen him get stronger as the week goes on hmm. so he's not you know your regular you know vocalist he's somebody that that he has another gear that guys can't get to very cool yeah. so I want to ask you about your influences and musical background, but you want me, want me to try to play that one little clip of the song where you have the bass break? Because sure. that's really cool. Sure. Let me see if I can do this here. Let's see. Um, you can always edit it in after. <laughs> I can always edit it in after. Well, we'll try not to. Let's see if we can do it like this. Can you see that? Yes, you can see it.
So, tell us. <laughs> about that and maybe throw in where some of those influences and how you came up with some of those uh the the that part in particular well you know i'm of the school of basis that i can't play the same thing twice the same way so and where does that so, come from um that's just playing a zillion years playing with people and that you know it it's something that I used to like to do. And then I played with some musicians that didn't like me doing it. And that is, I like to chase you through a solo, which means I like to push you through. Mm -hmm. And not everybody likes it. Some people really like why, why I, when I originally played it, I played it straight. I just said that, 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 that. Da, 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 and then I dropped it down da, 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 and when the guitar solo came in but I played it straight all the way through and then Mike said play something basically play something else you know you know play it like you want to play it mm -hmm. and I said are you sure <laughs> because you gotta ask because you know like you and i were talking about once you open that box up there's no closing it back especially with you <laughs> yeah. so he he did and like i said i did a i did a couple of takes and most of what you hear is the first take wow which is you know that that initial influence of like it you know and there's a part when he's actually playing the guitar solo where he goes up and i just we both come down together and it's really nice because we didn't play it together initially but it sounds like we played it together and it sounds like we planned it and that's the idea of you know playing with other music is that you're doing things that are spontaneous but they sound like you wrote them that way right you know when it's done well that's what it sounds like right yeah. you know listen to you know we talk about influences like you know my my official big influence the guy that made me start playing bass is billy cox okay. from ben sees okay. and i think if you listen to him and you listen to me on this record, you hear clearly that influence because there's, it's rock. It's clearly rock, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of blues and funk and, you know, and punk and all kind of stuff in there as well. It's all mixed together. And that's, you know, that's also the idea is that my influences don't come from one genre. You know, you get guys that say, you yeah, uh, know, I only listen to jazz basses. I only listen to fusion basses. I only listen to, you know, R&B basses. Uh, I only listen to rock basses. I listen, I never just listen to one thing. I always listen to everything. So my, my influences come from everywhere. And I might throw you know, something that sounds John and Twillish into something that's a pure funk game. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I get a look like, what was that? But usually I get a smile from a guitar player or a drummer when I when I do that, because they know what I'm doing. Right. So it's it's nice to see that as well. You know, but it's also nice to not have to, you know, when you draw from your influences that you draw from multiple places. And how do you draw from your influences? Like you mentioned Ed Whistle, Billy Cox, and a few others. Have you like played the songs or transcribed them that you hear something like, oh, that's a cool riff that John played in like this Who song and you transcribe you it? Know, I, I don't I don't think I ever sat down. I think the only bass solo that I ever sat down and learned note for note was um, there's, there's a group called Mandrill okay. in the 70s and 80s. And their bass player was a guy named Fudgy K, who is one of my absolute favorite bass players of all time. And I think this song was Ape is High, and there's a bass solo in that song. And it's the only bass solo I ever copied, really? note for note. 
and it was it was early on in my playing so it wasn't as technical as things like Vulcan Worlds by Stanley Clark okay you know where I was when I heard that song the first time I was waving my bass okay. over the garden um <laughs> Stanley could do that to you um but so it was early enough that it was it it technically it kind of nurtured me into that thing and to into improvisation while I play and I kind of really dug that but in most other places you know how I learn things that I hear thank god I got really good ears Okay, because most of the time I'm not just sitting down and learning somebody else's thing. Okay. You know, it's like I'll listen to it and I go, I can I can hear it and go, oh, that's what they're doing. And then I'll play it, you know, and I'll find myself playing it in a gig somewhere. Oh. And I go, oh, that's where I stole that from. And I'm not the only guy that does that. We know that. <laughs> Borrowed or whatever improved yeah. upon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so can you give any advice to any bass players watching like how you developed your awesome groove and feel and well uh, i think part of my my groove how i hear hmm? because i hear things innately behind the beat okay. um i don't think that i think it can be learned but it doesn't have the same feel as somebody who does it naturally. Um, if you hear things on the beat, work with that. Learn how to make that groove. Okay. If you hear things on top of the beat or a little ahead, you know, not ahead of the beat, but in the top end of the beat, mm -hmm. um, learn to work with that. Learn to work with what you have first for groove. If you hear it there, learn to make that work. Um, then you can learn how to make it play back. Because if someone asks me sometimes, I, I did a, um, a Broadway-ish play that was, you know, they I don't even know if they got the previews. But I remember the musical director who was the, she was also the musical director for Mamma Mia. Um, she asked me after the one of the songs, she says, why are you playing late? And I said, I'm not playing late. I'm playing in the back end of the beat. I'm not late. She says, yeah, but it sounds funny with the drummer. And I said, she's never done this before. So she didn't know. And it was all rock stuff. And when I said something to the drummer, the drummer says, don't change it. Stay where you are. Right? And I said, nah, I'm going to play where she asked me to play it. So I know how to play in the top end of the beat or in the middle of the beat to get there. Is it comfortable? Oh, hell no. <laughs> it is not comfortable. But it's if it's something that makes somebody else comfortable, I can do that mm -hmm. for the time being. And then what you do is that you do the thing like um, you eventually slide back a little at a time as opposed to playing it where you originally went. You start on the beat and you pull it back just a little touch, a little touch to where you're comfortable and they can't tell the difference anymore because you did it so gradually. And that's kind of what I did with that. Um, as far as sound and things like that, originally like... Um, find a bass player you like if it's larry graham if it's john paul jones if it's sid vicious mm -hmm. learn how they got their sound and fully imitate it at first because you'll come you will come out of that imitation you know if you're capable some people will get there and they just won't they won't move any further. But most people, you know, with ears will find their own sound out of that imitation. You know, like, you know, there were a lot of saxophone, there's a lot of professional saxophone players that obviously listened to David Sanborn for a long time. 
and you can tell by every note they play. Um, there are bassists that sound like Jaco Pistorius, a friend of mine. Um, there are bassists that sound like Stanley Clark. There are a ton of bassists that sound like Marcus Miller. Right. And there are a ton of bassists that sound like Anthony Jackson. That's a bit harder to do. <laughs> to More sound like, like to piece, imitate right? Anthony is a bit harder to do because he is such there are technical things in his playing that you have to master first before you even think about the sound. You know? And he's like I said, he's another favorite because of the you know, when you listen to him, it's like listening to its perfect time, its perfect groove. Uh, the intonation of his instruments is perfect. It's just, you listen, you go like, whoa. Every time you listen to him, there's just something about that. You know, Jaco, you listen to him, it was the beauty of the tone. Ah, good example, good example. Um, I met Jaco on the street. I was playing outside of FIT with a band I was playing. And Jaco walked up and I was singing and, and I was playing a fretless at the time. And he walks up, he saw I was playing a fretless and singing. He basically walked up, pulled my hand off my bass and shook my hand, right? And then after the set, we talked and he says, well, I'm right up the block. He was at Top Cat that was on the up the block. Mm -hmm. and he said come with me so I walked with him down the block and I mean it really was in the next block wow. so I walked with him down the block and we went into the studio and in the studio was Harlem Bullock and Kenwood Denard right and Jocko's bass so they played I think it was Ode to Billy Joe right and that's the thing where he would throw the bass to Kenwood at the end of the song mm -hmm. right so at the end of the song, you know, he gives me the bass. I said, wow, this is Jaco's bass. I'm going to sound just like that. And I played three or four notes and that just didn't happen. Hmm. And I said, wow. So it, the, the lesson learned in that was that Jaco sounded like that on anything he played. And it was purely his hand. Yeah, and I had already had a sound. I just, you know, when you're younger, you you're figuring, well, maybe I should sound like this, or maybe I should sound like that. Mm -hmm. After that encounter, I said, I need to sound like me. Yeah, and now if you hear me, um, I have another friend, a guitar player. You know him, Stu Cutler. Yeah, yeah, right. Stu. And Stu told me one time, he said, because he's seen me play, oh, two dozen basses, you know, conservatively, two, mm -hmm. two dozen different basses. And I, I'd ask him, I'd say, how does this sound? He'd, he'd look at me and laugh and go, you sound the same on everything. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. So... You know, I have all the, I have boutique instruments and all of that sort of stuff. He says, you sound the same. The the inexpensive ones and the expensive ones, you sound the same on every one of them you play. <laughs> which means that my hands have taken over, which is the idea. Yeah, it's the idea. That's a huge compliment, yeah. right? I mean, so, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a good compliment, but it means I'm wasting my money elsewhere. Um, <laughs> some of the, ba some bases are just more easier to play and, yeah. Some bases like I just want to play and other bases I have. And it's like, yeah, that one's that one's a little harder to play. And I don't like I totally it. agree. I totally agree. You get an instrument that you like that is conducive to what your hands do. Exactly. That's the other thing. Yeah. Um, some people have asked me, you know, I've watched bases play and I watch guys with great left hands and lousy right hands. I've got watch guys with monster right hands, lousy left hands, right? And the idea, you know, I started on electric bass and then I went to double bass, upright bass. Okay. And what I learned on upright bass is if both hands aren't working correctly, you sound like crap 100% of the time. Mm. 
50% doesn't work on that instrument. So I said, hmm, let's pull that over to electric bass because if both hands are happening, then it's happening. Yeah. You can cheat a little bit more on electric bass, but like I said, I know guys that are pros that are playing great gigs that either don't have a great left hand or don't have a great right hand. And I know a lot of guys that have great, you know, both hands are killing. Mm. You know, Marcus being one of them, uh, James Genus being another one of them. Uh, Anthony Jackson. Black people being, you know, you know, a bunch of those guys, they, they just have spectacular technique. Yeah. You know, and the late great TM Stevens. Yeah. Who had, who had you know, if you watched his technique, you said he looks so sloppy, but he sounds so neat. Mm. There were no loose ends in his playing, but it, it it was a real rock and roll performance kind mm. of thing, you know, because his thumb was over the top of the neck and stuff like that. But then you listen to what he's playing, you go like, that's no garden variety rock bass player. <laughs> No, no, exactly. No, no. You listen you to know. like well, all he even worked with like bands like the Pretenders and stuff like that. Yeah, and like, yeah. And you listen to the you know you to the Pretenders ever had. You know, he had, he had a very original approach. Yeah. And he was one of the people. I think the first time he saw me play, I was I met him very early. I think I was still in high school, and he called himself by a different name at the time. But I, you know, it took me years to recognize that's who I was meeting at the time, wow. right? And I remember, because he was really advanced at that point. He was way beyond where I was even thinking of going at that mm -hmm. point. And he saw me play and he came up and being TM, TM said, you have great left hand, right? Mm -hmm. And without saying it, it was that. You need to work on this hand a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Need to work on that right hand a little bit. And I did. And like I said, by the time I got to by the time I got to double bass, double bass taught me, like I said, that 50% of it don't work. <laughs> you have to have both of it. You know, and it, it, it was he was always positive, which is another thing that I really loved about him was that he never said anything negative about anybody. It was always a positive thing he saw. And when you think of who he was and where he wound up, that's a very rare thing. Yeah, it was a big, it's a big loss to the uh, base community, now, the I, community, yeah. Yeah, now I'm not exactly like that. If I think something is wrong. This is this is where the classically trained musician comes out of it. <laughs> if I think something sucks in your technique, that's the first thing out of my mouth. It's like you need to fix this. Yeah. And it's like I'm not saying it nastily. It's just that it's got to be done. Right. You know, it's got to be done. And I'll say it to drummers and stuff like that because I I played with drummers that were phenomenal but had a lousy right foot you know, or had, you know, when they played their their fills, their fills never came back in time hmm. and stuff like that. So I'll say something to those guys, and but it's usually, I don't do it with everybody else watching. And that's the part that I won't do. Because if I do it with everybody else watching, it's like I'm trying to bring myself up while bringing them down. And that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make the whole groove happen. So I usually do it, you know, where it's just me and that person talking. Right. And I say, you know, if we both do this together, you know, do you want me to play so you know where this is at? Right. All the time. Right. And, you know, I've had drummers say, yeah, I do want you to play. And then I have other guys that say, no, I don't want you to play anything while I'm playing. Yeah, it's important. It's important to know where the other person wants you to be because then they're more sure they can play stronger within mm -hmm. their own framework of what they do. So, yeah. Anyway, so that's great. So it sounds like 
play the groove, learn, learn within yourself, listen, develop your own sound based upon like one of your favorite players, and then go out and play a lot, it sounds like. Go out and play a lot. Try a whole bunch of equipment because there's a whole lot of stuff that's around. Some of it is good for you. Some of it costs too much for you. Some of it will be just right. Yeah, that's cool. You know? Well, thanks for your time, Booker. We're almost out of time here. So okay. appreciate everything. And uh, I'll catch up with you uh, in, in a minute, okay? Okay. Well, let me see. Thank you very much.